yeah, we just want to welcome you. And today we have Paddy Seri. Is that for, it's Cherry that? actually? Cherry, sorry. From Minima Protocol, and he's going to be speaking to us today about blockchains in a Bitcoin world. Um, Paddy, I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, yep, yeah, I'm a deep techie. Uh, been coding for 35 years. Fell in love with crypto 10 years ago, and I've been falling down that rabbit hole ever since. Um, so today, I would like to talk about blockchains in a Bitcoin world. You can all see my screen, yeah? So, in the beginning was the word, and the word was Bitcoin. And this revolutionary idea that we still don't understand, you know, the full ramifications. Now, Bitcoin is trying to be a base layer, monetary, blockchain protocol. And I'm not joking when I say that we may have to just rewrite the history books. We're just going to say in 2009, Bitcoin launched, and then everything that happened up until then is just going to be a footnote. Because we're literally standing on the cusp of the dawn of the third age of man. Yeah? We, we are within reach of being free from shackles that have bound us for millennia. Money underpins everything. And so however big you think Bitcoin is, it's bigger. So when looking at these you know, protocols, there's many moving pieces that all overlap over each other. And since we're in a period that I referred to as the Clone Wars, where many disparate different groups and teams are trying to come up with a better Bitcoin, I thought I'd go through what these pieces are and you know, how they stick together so that maybe we can have a better idea about what it is that we're all doing here. So POW, proof of work. This is the beating heart of Bitcoin. Proof of work requires energy, external energy. You need to put work into the system. This is very useful. Um, this is objective. This means that when I look at two blockchains, I can independently verify and tell which one has had more work put into it without asking anybody anything. So not only is proof of work a consensus engine, it is also a commodity, like gold is a commodity or silver, something that you have to dig out of the ground. And this gives it intrinsic value. It's actually valuable in and of itself. The, uh, the argument the, the, the value argument for Bitcoin, for, for power networks goes, proof of work is expensive, so attacking the chain is expensive. Attacking the chain is expensive, so the chain is secure. The chain is secure, so the chain is valuable. This is a nice linear logical argument that goes from energy in to a valuable chain. Yeah, makes sense. It's like, okay, understand. And we refer to this as unforgeable costliness. You can't fake it, you can't duplicate it, you've actually got to do the work to get that chain. Um, and that's proved, you know, very, very valuable. Now, PARS, proof of stake, is a new consensus engine that they've come up with. Now, this requires no energy, yeah, which is why you know, some people really like it. And the difference is that POS is subjective. Yeah? I can't distinguish two POS chains from each other independently. I have to ask somebody something, I have to get a, a reference from somewhere to tell me which chain is which. Now this is very, you know, it can be very useful, but it's not valuable in and of itself. And when you try to do the argument for the value of a POS chain, it goes something like the chain is valuable. And so you know, the, the chain is valuable, so staking is expensive. Staking is expensive, so an attack is expensive. An attack is expensive, so the chain is secure. The chain is secure, so the chain is valuable. Uh, have you seen what I've done there? I've had to start with the chain is valuable, and I've had to end with the chain is valuable. 
Now, you're not allowed to do that, yeah? This is called a circular logical fallacy. You can't give yourself a leg up. You can't just say, look, I'm valuable because I'm valuable. Now, that's fine. As I said, uh, this is very useful. If I were eight banks who didn't trust each other and they wanted to use a blockchain amongst themselves, they would not use a power protocol. They would use a POS protocol, yeah? Because the information is subjective to them. Um, Another example that I, I find quite useful is that recently the, the Minima team um, have had to switch to Telegram from WhatsApp. Yeah, we're all using WhatsApp and now we've had to switch to Telegram because they do the big group where you can have an open public forum where lots of users can join in and WhatsApp don't do that. So I was like, nah, nah, nah. I switched over to Telegram and now everything is exactly the same. I have, all my, my friends have switched over, I use it. My, the security assumptions are the same. The messaging is the same. And in fact, the one feature that Telegram does, the edit button, shows that you know, you're useful right up until the point where something more useful comes along. And this is the point. There's nothing intrinsically valuable about WhatsApp. Yeah? Telegram and WhatsApp are frankly interchangeable. They both do exactly the same thing. Um, and so you can switch between them and you're not losing anything. This is not possible with a proof of work chain, but this is possible with a proof of stake chain. And I think topically, looking, if anybody knows, the, the, the current Uniswap versus SushiSwap DeFi debacle, you know, where Uniswap, a great team, people working on it, good for the, for the ecosystem, lots of work. SushiSwap comes along, does a little tweak, little hack, one week later, everybody jumps over. And that's fine, because there's no loyalty in this game, yeah? It's like if they offer something that you want, you'll switch to them. Same as us switching to Telegram. They offered something that we wanted, so we switched to them. So this is the point about POS. Yes, it's very useful, but no, it's not intrinsically valuable. Now, once you've got your engine, you need to think of your monetary policy. Yeah. How much money is in your system? How much will there be in the future? What is the relationship um, between time and quantity? And there's different schools of thought here. So you can either have a hard cap. This is how much money there is, and there's never going to be any more. This is known as hard money. And then you've got those who believe in an inflationary currency. And they say, no, we're going to have to print, you know, we're going to have to just, you know, make more money as time goes on. Uh, and they both have their reasons. Now, the public, you know, ev you know, evidently, when you look at it, understand and want hard money. They feel far more comfortable knowing that there's a fixed amount of the currency that they're playing with. But in the minor paradigm, in the paradigm where you have miners who work on the chain, you have to pay them. And when you have a hard currency with hard limits and hard money, how are you going to pay them without printing more money? And they say, well, we'll, print, we'll pay them with the fees. And then it's like, well, are the fees going to be enough? And this, these two schools are sort of fighting with each other. In fact, I would say it's the defining quality between you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum. You know, Bitcoin is hard money and Ethereum is inflationary money. But the truth is that money is a winner takes all game. Yeah, nobody's going to put their money into a less hard version, into a less hard currency. You know, we see that. And in fact, topically again, even though the last couple of months have all been, you know, no question, the DeFi scene on Ethereum has been exciting and interesting and all these wonderful projects and blah, 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 but they went for Bitcoin because they went for hard money, because that's actually what matters. The value is there. You know, they're up for a crypto asset, not for a crypto applications. So monetary policy, very important. So you've got your engine, you've got your monetary policy. Now you've got your power. How much power do you need to put on your chain? And this is also very important because there's multiple layers to this. Yeah, there's the base layer, layer one. This is the layer that everybody has to process. Anybody who wants to use the blockchain has to process layer one. This does not scale. Yeah, it never does on any chain. There's no way of scaling it. Whatever people may say, whatever sharding enthusiasts, layer one does not scale. You have to go higher up, up the stack into the higher levels. And so I think of it as the lawyer, the club, and the player. The club and the player draw up a contract that says, with the lawyer, which says, we will pay you 10,000 pounds a week as long as you turn up and you don't do drugs, okay? Now there's two ways that this can be played out. Option one, every week they go to the lawyer and the lawyer 
asks the clerk, has he turned up, looks at the record from the, from the hospital report, whatever signed, and says, okay, he hasn't done his drugs, he's gone to the thing, he's fine. The lawyer enforces the payment. This is a layer one transaction. And then there's option two, which is where the club and the player actually deal with themselves, yeah? Now they've drawn up the contract that says, look, don't, don't muck about, yeah? So the club and the player can interact with each other and the club just keeps paying the player and they never have to go to the lawyer. And the only time they have to go and see the lawyer is if somebody tries to break the contract, if there is a dispute, yeah? Then you have to pop back down from your layer two, yeah? So before they were just interacting with each other, now they have to pop back to the lawyer. This does scale because the lawyer can serve as tens of thousands of contracts with lots of different parties. Whereas if he had to be there every single time something happened, he could do 50 parties a week, he could do nothing. Whereas he could be doing tens of thousands of people a week if they actually dealt with each other and only came to him when there was a problem, which is exactly what we see in the real world. Yeah, whenever you draw up a contract, you don't actually enforce it unless somebody breaks it. This is also exactly why, how you know, the Lightning Network works. Yeah, you interact with people on the Lightning Network instantly, you know, just brilliantly. And then only when there is a dispute where you wish to end the relationship, do you go back to the lawyer. And in this analogy, the lawyer is the blockchain. Yeah. Because what is the price of power? Yeah. What do you, what is the cost? Ethereum has paid a price for its Turing complete global state mega beast chain. Yeah. What is that price? They have paid in decentralization. Clearly, Ethereum is not decentralized. Yeah because 99.999% of people who use Ethereum use MetaMask without running a version of Ethereum themselves. So, you know, it's, it is not the case that more power is better. Yeah, you have to balance all of these things together. And then the last one is, is the fork wars. Yeah, because if you give your chain power and then you want to upgrade and you're like, ah, actually, I wish we'd done this. It's called forking. Yeah, you have to come up with a new chain, and if they don't come along with you, they go off on their on on the old chain, and you go off in the new chain. And what we see, looking at all the times this has happened, is that there's always those who don't want to go with the new one. They're like, no, 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 it's good enough as it is, and they're like, no, no, no we need to do this new thing, and you end up splitting your community. Yeah, fork was frankly always end badly. Yeah, you don't want to be forking. It's like it it, it, it disrupts the momentum. Of your, of your blockchain community. So very difficult to come up with the right amount of power. Decentralization. Anti-censorship through decentralization is the one true value proposition of a blockchain. And if you're not gonna have anti-censorship, then there's no point having a blockchain. Yeah, it's as simple as that. And recently with all the you know rather you know the, the large chains that have come out this seems to have been forgotten along the way yeah the network seems to be defined by the most powerful computer on it they're like hey you know we've got kubernetes clusters running our network because we can do a lot or we've got 21 you know super hardcore mega computers doing what we do on eos so that you can do a lot but that's exact that's not the point the network is not defined by the most powerful computer on it. The network is defined by the least powerful computer on it, because that means that more people can run the network, can keep up with the network. And all you do is you sacrifice the decentralization, which is the only way we know of attaining the anti-censorship, which is the only value proposition of blockchains. So sets versus subsets. If you have the mentality that says, look, you know, they're, they're, there's a team, there's a, there's a group of us. And then 90% of them say, you know what? We need to get rid of that 10%. Because if we get rid of them, we can do so much more. We'll just have, you know, we can run it faster. We can do more transactions. We can do this. Blah, 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 blah. We, can, we can just become a, a subset. Don't worry, it's just a small, we're only going to cut 10% off. 90% will still be here. No problem at all. Okay, let's say you do that. Six months later, you've now got the subset of the set. In that subset, there's going to be people going, you know what? We need to get rid of that 10%. Because if we get rid of them, we can do more transactions. Honestly, we won't even notice it. We're only gonna get rid of a small amount. We're just gonna become a smaller subset of the whole. And this will go on and on and on. And as soon as you have the mentality that a subset of the whole is adequate, there's only one way that ends. Just a tiny little subset, you know, maintaining the entire group. 
these subsets of users will expect remuneration. They will be providing something for the network. Now, if, I'm, if you're piggybacking off me, I want something. This always centralizes, yeah? There's no other way around it. Economies of scale, we see this everywhere, including in the mining scene, both PAL and POS. And so you'll just end up removing the decentralization, which gives the anti-censorship, which is the only point of the whole, of the whole project. And the question, do you run a full node? Is this eternal thing that sort of floats above us all? And whenever you're running these chains, the question is, do you run a full node? Because if you don't run a full node, then you're not doing it right, then it's broken. Right? And you're not participating in the network in the correct fashion. You're piggybacking off someone. You're simply replacing one ruler for another ruler. Yeah? And that's not what you want. So decentralization is key, very, very important. But the question, when designing a monetary blockchain protocol, you have to ask yourself, what is the most valuable, most powerful, most scalable blockchain we can create where every single member of the network runs it in full? If you're not trying to answer that question, then you're asking the wrong question because that's what everybody wants, yeah? This is, what I'm this is, this is what's the... The dilemma that we all seem to be having at the moment is like, ah, the, the set of validators is getting smaller, the set of people who are running the chain is smaller, you know. So from the offset, you need to be thinking in a way where we don't get a subset, yeah, where everybody's running it, where it is going to be valuable, where it's powerful enough, where it's scalable. Yeah, this is the question that we need to be answering. And so the answer, when you think about what we have talked about. Uh, just now, certain things become clear. Number one, it has to be power backed. Yeah, if we want this to be valuable, if we want this to be intrinsic, if we want this to be unforgeable, if we want this to be scarce, it needs to be power backed. It needs to be hard capped. Yeah, because we see when we look out there in the wild what happens to chains that aren't hard capped. The public simply isn't interested. They want to know that this is all there is. There aren't going to be any more that their percentage of the total stays the same. I think that's fair enough. It needs to be finished. Yeah, this whole idea that you can just constantly fork and upgrade and keep changing the chain. All you do is splinter your community. All you do is weaken the momentum of your chain. You need to come up with a design and you need to say, this is it, lads. This is the one. It's finished. Now, when you're thinking everybody needs to run it, yeah, no, you know, everybody doesn't have a, a laptop let alone an online cloud server, let alone the ability to set up a Kubernetes cluster. Yeah. And in fact, when you think about it, there's only one device that everybody actually has access to. So if you want everybody to run it, it's got to be mobile native because a mobile, you know, a smartphone, incredibly powerful computer, I might add, is the only device that everybody has. So if you want everybody to run it, it has to be mobile native. And lastly, no centralization. Now, you know, you can't, the centralization is incredibly pernicious. It is, in, it is incredibly, you know, efficient. Yeah. That's why as soon as, if there's the smallest crack of centralization, it'll just keep on coming and take over everything because that's what centralization does. So from the off, you need to come up with a protocol that doesn't have those forces, that doesn't have that pressure, that will remain decentralized today, tomorrow, forever. Yeah, no centralization. And the truth is that if you can't come up with something that does these five things, then you have to go back to the blackboard. Yeah, you have to start again. Yeah, don't tell me that it's not possible to come up with a blockchain that satisfies these criteria. Because frankly, 10 years ago, we all thought the Byzantine general's problem was impossible to solve until a brilliant individual named Satoshi Nakamoto came along and blew all our brains out with Bitcoin. Yeah, so it is possible. You just got to think about it laterally. Now, I am being a little bit cheeky, to be fair, because my team and I have been working on exactly this. The Minim protocol tries to answer that very question. So Minima is power backed, but it uses cooperative TX power, we call it, rather than competitive power, which centralizes. Yeah, so users mine their own transactions. They do a little bit of work and we sum all of that up and that's what builds the blocks. 
We don't pay people to do the work for us. We do it ourselves. It's hard capped. Yeah, there's a fixed amount of minima in the system. We use fee burn, since we don't have to pay miners, only to order the transactions. And this is really, really useful for two reasons. Because it means that fees don't need to be high because they're not part of the security equation. Our security is power backed. Yeah, so the fees are simply a way of congestion control, spam, you know, reduce DDoS prevention, and for the order of the transactions in the upcoming blocks. And it also means that when transactions migrate to layer two, when that economic activity leaves the base layer, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't hurt the system as it does with other blockchains because you need to pay your miners. So for two reasons, that works really well. It's finished, the protocol is done, we're, we're, we've written it down, that's all it does. It's, it's scalable from day one. You know, you can edit the, the block size by coin by chain vote. Um, you know, it's quantum secure because the truth is that 20 years from now, fine, it doesn't matter today whether it's quantum secure, but 20 years from now, it's gonna matter, 25 years from now. And if you think that we're gonna be able to hard fork this chain 25 years from now, then you haven't seen IPv6, yeah? They've been trying to crowbar that into the internet for the last 15 years and it's been a complete failure. Because once you ossify, once you're there, you're not changing anything. So you need to be ready today for that moment 25 years from now when they do crack quantum security, you know, quantum computers, which obviously we're gonna do. And the whole chain fits in full and runs on your phone. We've designed it you know, from the off as a, as a mobile native protocol. We use some Evertix, M Evertix, MMR databases, et cetera, et cetera. So it doesn't take up a lot of space and everybody can just run it. You know, I'm sure 30 years ago, the idea of running an email client was like, oh, do you run an email client? It's like, yeah, you know, I don't, do you? Whereas nowadays it's like, yeah, of course I do. And this is what it has to be. It has to be like an afterthought. It's like, yeah, that'll be, obviously I run a full version of it. You know, it's totally easy. And so everybody runs everything all the time. Everybody's involved in full validation and full construction of the chain. I don't have to trust anybody for anything. I'm not replacing one set of rulers with another. And that's the minimum protocol. So if you've liked any of what I've said this evening, you know, do please come and join us. We, we, we'll take you with open arms. Thanks for listening. Minimum.global. That's it. Thanks a lot, Patty. So can everyone hear me? My, my connection is a little bit uh, poor. Can you hear me, Patty? Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you, yes. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was very interesting. I would love to hear a little bit more actually about Minima, how specifically it works and what use cases it enables. But maybe let's see first, so far, if we have any questions. Shall I stop forward. sharing my screen or shall I, so we can have uh, Yes, please, if you could show or stop sharing, I think it might improve the okay. bandwidth here. Ah, yes. Ooh, 1245 by 525. This is the biggest Zoom grid I've been on. Huh. Um, if anyone has any questions, please write them in the chat now. Uh, how do I get the chat up? Chat. Okay. Just seeing if anyone is writing. If not, uh, I can I can start with my question. So wh yeah, why don't we start with my question? I mean, I'm curious to uh, hear where is Minima now if it's already launched in the mainnet and what type of use cases you expect uh, to see first first of all on Minima. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. No, we're a couple of, I mean, testnet's been out for six months, but it's been a nerd fest, basically, just developers, uh, the whole thing's written in Java. That's been ticking along very nicely. And we are a couple of weeks away from releasing our first public APK so that non-nerds can access the internet. Um, but we're functionally complete. Um, it runs on your phone, it does everything that it's going to do, um, and yeah, it, it's, uh, it's looking very nice. In terms of use cases and et cetera, et cetera, clearly being mobile native, uh, we are in discussion with a few telcos uh, who are very interested in using it for tokenizing different aspects of their network, et cetera. Minima has a 
very clean tokenization system, UTXO model, uh, very efficient. Um, and so lots and lots of ways that we can save the telcos money. So they're very interested in using it, which is a win-win situation for us because basically they can get it on all the phones and we can save them loads of money. So both of us uh, would be very happy with, with, with this continuing. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, and just one follow-up question. If I want to build anything on Minima, what uh, programming languages could I use? So the actual on-chain layer one scripting language um, is similar to Bitcoin's, although Bitcoin is a subset of Minima. Uh, it's a very simple, uh, basic type language, um, but with some very nice features. So you've got a, a sort of transactional state um, and you can do, you know, all the things that you expect to be able to do with a smart contract. But uh, one of the things that we've learned from the blockchain space is that the reason Ethereum has done so well is because it opened itself up to the web development community. You know, massive centralization issues aside, MetaMask and the ability to write web applications has been a real, you know, a real uh, boon, a really successful thing that Ethereum has done so that everybody can write these web apps and integrate them into the smart contracts on the blockchain. Minima takes this a step further and has something known as the mini DAP system. Each Minima node runs a little web server with a little SQL database, a little file access, and you actually write websites as complicated as any website you can actually write you know, out there on, in the wild. Um, and that's how you interface with the blockchain and that's how you write your application. So any web developer should be able to start writing applications on, on minimum because I, I think that's been you know, so successful on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have one question from Dan Joe. Could you explain how it is DDoS proof? Uh, so the same way that Bitcoin is DDoS proof. Um, the idea of free transactions doesn't work, yeah? The, you, you need to pay to have your transactions sent across the network. On minimum, we don't have miners per se, so users have to burn some of their coin to send their transaction. Um, now, they also have to do POW yeah, on the transaction to send it, but POW only prevents DOS attacks. It does not prevent DDoS attack, distributed denial of service attacks. So the power is there, but you also have to burn. And this is frankly the same as all chains, yeah? you just have to pay. So um, it's just very, very expensive to start sending loads and loads of messages. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, no questions so far from the audience apart from that. I think people are still thinking. Should I tell you what the floor in Minima is? There are, sorry to interrupt, there are actually questions. I don't know if you just can't see it. Oh, like, I, there's one I from, can't see any. There's one from Barry Sherman who's asking, ah. if proof of stake has no real value, why are so many other chains adopting it? Because, that's a very good question. Um, because they feel that proof of work is a waste of energy, I think. They feel that you can get the same as a proof of work chain with a proof of stake chain. Um, and this simply isn't the case. In fact, I would say the fact that there are so many proof of stake chains absolutely, you know, you know, proves what I've been saying about there being no scarcity to this. Yeah, proof of work chains eat each other. Yeah, there's no proof of work. There's only one, two, three, you know, proof of work chains because the larger ones just devour the smaller ones. Proof of stake chains, there's loads of them, like messaging apps, because you can actually, um, you know, you can run your proof of stake chain with you know the initial stakeholders and you don't need to put energy into the system um and so you think that your chain is is secure and the truth is that even though it is useful it is not valuable this is the thing that the proof of stake chains need to understand um so yeah uh, you know cardano tezos neo tron i'm looking at all of you i mean eth2 you know ETH, yeah, i think they're i think they're really shooting self, themselves in the foot uh, with this whole ETH2 massive mega bacon chain nonsense, frankly. Sorry. Um, Caitlin, do you mind to read the questions because I still don't see anything after? No, no, no problem. Um, so the next question is from David Moore. In, yeah. He's asking, how many transactions should Minima be able to reach on layer one? Uh, so realistically, I think layer one, you know, in a, you know, in the next, five years, if we can hit sort of 
50, 100 transactions per second. That's really not where the action needs to take place though. What you want is you want a thousand to one, you know, layer two transactions. And the truth is that we've already seen that this is possible. You know, the Lightning Network could today with frankly minuscule amounts of people actually on it handle 50,000 transactions per second. Um, so yeah, let's say 50 to 100 transactions per second on chain with 50,000 to 100,000 transactions per second off chain. Uh, which I think is totally doable. You know, we see that possible already. Um, I mean, it, it, if I expand on that point, when you get a complicated chain with a global state and a Turing complete language, it's very hard to do the, the shift from off chain to on chain. It's very hard to take the state, take it off chain, muck about with it, and then move it back on chain. Whereas when you have the UTXO model, which is what Minimum uses and which is what Bitcoin uses, it's actually far more geared towards this off-chain mentality. And in fact, the L2 protocol, which is like the next version of Lightning that Minima fully supports and that Bitcoin hopes to support it if it ever gets another hard fork, is effectively, you can do anything you can do on, the, you know, on, on layer one, just with a smaller set of people and a smaller amount of money. But in that set of users, the UTXO model with its sequence-based transaction, which is what L2 does. You can basically do anything. You know, this is really, really useful. This is, you know, it's, you know, which you can't do on Ethereum. So currently, all the beautiful apps on Ethereum, they're all totally base layer. They all run with the lawyer all the time, which is why all of us have been priced out, yeah? which is why all of us can't go to do anything. Because whenever I, I try to send an Ethereum transaction yesterday, they wanted 50 bucks. And I'm like, that's the, that's the total amount that I'm trying to send. And this is what happens. And unfortunately, you can't take those protocols and move them off chain. And if you are going to be going off chain, then you don't need these massive Turing complete bloated layer ones. Yeah. What you need is to be able to verify disputes on layer one. And you need to be able to do everything off chain. That, that's the difference. Yeah. Thanks, Paddy. And speaking of layer one, um, we have a question from Lal de la Mall. Sorry if I'm butchering your name, um, who's asking um, just what is layer one, which really just means that it isn't scaled, but perhaps you could go into a bit more detail. Yeah, no. so when you're running your blockchain and you're sending your blocks out, everybody needs to process those blocks. Yeah, and that's how we reach consensus amongst ourselves. The accountants are the ones who are processing all the transactions. So whenever, when I mean layer one, all I mean is these are the transactions that everybody has to process. And if you think about that, if everybody has to process them, then clearly you're not going to be able to do a lot with that. Yeah, You're going, your network is going to be defined by the least powerful computer on the network. So, you know, since Minima is expecting to work in, you know, Africa and Nigeria on your mobile phone, you're not going to be running a high frequency trading desk you know, with thousands and millions of transactions per second that everybody's going to process. But that doesn't matter because what does matter is that you can actually run your high frequency trading desk off chain on layer two, where you only interact with the people actually involved in that transaction. That's the difference. Where instead of sending the transaction for everybody to process, the base layer, yeah, layer one, only those involved in the transaction process the layer two transactions. That's far, you know, that is scalable. That means that I can transact with someone and you can be transacting with someone and as many times as I want with them and you can be transacting with me and I don't see your transactions and you don't see my transactions. Yeah. Clearly that's that, you know, that does scale. Yeah. And only if we have a dispute, if only if one of us tries to, you know, cheat the other person, do we have to pop down to the base layer and say, Hey, look, something, something funny is going on here, uh, which is exactly how the lightning network works, which is why it works. Thank you. Um, another question. This is a question from Stephen Brooks. Is Minima locked to your phone? And if you lose the phone, what would happen with the funds? Does it use the same security and recovery? Good question. Um, Minima requires participation, by which I mean, you know, if you want to be free from trusting anybody, if you want to be in charge, then yeah, it's up to you. And if you lose your phone, I mean, if you haven't made a backup of your private keys, yeah, you have to make a backup. Uh, but if you don't make a backup, no, there isn't anybody out there who, you know, who, who's got your information. Now that's okay, because we've actually come up with systems, proof circles, 
uh, where other users can look after your things. You'll have to remember your password, your 12 phrase, yeah? But the truth is that if you forget the keys to your, to your coins, either you trust somebody with that key or you have a multi-sig, yeah? But even in a multi-sig, it's like, would you put your money in, a, in somewhere where four out, of, four out of five of your friends wanted to, they could take your money? I mean, that's fine. I'm sure they won't take your money, but you know, there's levels that, you're, that you, know, you have to go down. And if you want to be independent and you want to be in charge of your own money, then it's up to you. And yeah, if you lose your coins and you lose your passwords, you lose your money. Or you can ask somebody to keep, you know, half the key, he can keep half the key, you know, same, same as every other multi-sig type, uh, you know, scenario. So it's up to you. you know, how much trust do you want to give to other people? Very good. Thank you. Um... Uh, from Barry Sherman, do you think UTXO is enough? Is it programmable enough for everything we will need? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> absolutely, I do. It's just a data model, yeah? What we know is that the UTXO model works very well with proof databases with the MMRDB. Um, I think the real issue is actually the, whether you have a global state or a transactional state. Um, Ethereum, a lot of Ethereum's power comes from the global state that every transaction can access. Um, and if you want to think about that, it's like having a festival with one door. Because at the end of one transaction, I can actually do something that invalidates the next transaction, which means you have to process because we both have access to the same global state. And I might change something that he wants to access. So the UTXO model doesn't do it that way. Yeah? The UTXO model doesn't have a, a you know, our UTXO model doesn't have a global state, neither, neither does um, Bitcoin's. And that's really the bottleneck that causes these huge issues. You've got to think, well, look, what is the price of being the only person to use the big computer that the whole financial system is on? And clearly that's going to be astronomical, which is exactly what we see. You know, that, that, that's just not going to work. Um, yeah, if, if, I mean, aside from the UTXO model, I think I could... Uh, my original question, which I'm asking, um, you know, for all of you, does, can anybody here see what the floor in minima is? Yeah, like obviously we've had to pay a price. There is always a price for everything. There's nothing for nothing in this world. And to arrive with this system that runs on your phone, it's quantum secure, da, 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 everybody runs any, everything. You know, what was the price that we had to pay? Oleg, what's the price we had to pay? <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the trade-off between the three things, speed, uh, decentralization, and scalability, right? Uh, users, Oleg. No, not those three. Those three is fine. The triumvirate of da 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 Users. Minima requires a lot of users. It doesn't work with a small amount of users. Yeah? We, we, you know, we're going to have to have hundreds of thousands, millions of users you know, to consider the chain even secure enough to, you know, buy a, a meal or a burger or whatever without possibility of attack. And the truth is, if this is going to be the monetary system for the world, we need billions of users. Yeah. And frankly, the mobile network, which is where we're starting, is sort of going to be our test bed because it's going to be much easier to fix the bugs and da da da, you know, and all of that. The true prize is going to be the IoT network where you've got 10 trillion devices. And Minima is so resource efficient and small that you can fit it on IoT devices. So the eventual goal for all of this is actually that your toaster, you know, pays for the electricity it needs to toast the bread over a layer two transaction as and when you need it. You could, you know, you could put Minima on a chip. It would give people light bulbs. You'll send money to the light bulb to pay for the electricity as and when it needs it. This is the end game for a you know, resource efficient protocol like Minima. But yeah, we need a lot of users um, and it's not gonna work with a small amount of users. So I just wanted to say that, you know, in case anybody's wondering. Thanks, Patty. And so having said that about the users, will you, Spencer Collins is asking, will you have a token sale? When, when might that be? Uh, yep. Yeah. I'll be honest, I'm, I, I'm old fashioned. I think the protocol should be finished you know, we should be working before we start asking the public for their money. I'm not up for taking your money as a, you know, as a, as a, in the future, et cetera, et cetera. So I think our current plan is actually to have the token sale for real minima on mainnet when we launch. 
uh, which is looking like the you know middle of next year. You know, if the test net goes fine, my current my current standard says that if we find an issue, the three month clock restarts. So every time we find a problem, I got to wait another three months before we think even think about going to mainnet. But currently, you know, fingers crossed, it's looking like being uh, middle of next year, and um, then we will be having a token sale, of course, to you know distribute these coins to as many people as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Exciting. Okay, uh, kind of winding down. So a few more questions. If anyone has anything they want to ask, please just pop it in the chat. Um, question from Dan Mack. If every individual minds their own transactions, who is responsible for dictating the transactions that go into the next block? And how is consensus achieved between these block producers? Uh, yes, absolutely. Actually, there is one message sent across the minimum network. It's called a TX power message. Um, it's very simple. And what it means is that you have your transaction. You say, look, I want to pay him 20 minimum. Fine. What you also do is you attach a list of the transaction hashes at the end of your transaction, exactly the same as a compact block in Bitcoin. And you mine that, yeah? And you're expected to do 10 to 20 seconds work. But every, you know, the, 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 the blockchain protocol means that one transaction every 10 seconds, every, you have a 20 second blockchain block speed at the moment, is actually more powerful than it needs to be. Uh, I think Socrates in 2014 called it the super hash highway. And so what I mean is that when you do a little bit of work, sometimes you'll actually end up with a really, really low number. If you, if, if you know how proof of work uh, functions, you have to come up, you have to keep hashing random numbers until you come up with a small enough hash. But sometimes randomly, you actually come up with a really small hash, much smaller than it needs to be. Those automatically become blocks. So every single unit user who is mining a transaction to send it across the network because the message isn't forwarded unless you've done the work has a chance of their transaction actually being a block, yeah, a TX power block. And so if you can imagine a network where thousands, millions of TX power messages are being sent, layer two, you know, some on layer one, blah, 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 blah. blah. And out of that maelstrom of transactions, one, two, you know, the, uh, you can have you know you can have forks and, and branches just like a normal bitcoin chain become a block yeah and with a parent and all the information is in the chain a compact block is tiny the extra information you have to put into your transaction is you know a, a small percentage of the whole um but at the end of the day it's a power blockchain yeah just the same as bitcoin's a power blockchain we have blah, 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 and we use ghost heaviest branch to determine what the uh, what the consensus is Thank you. Um, question from Elias Namir. How much storage is required to run the node on your phone? So currently, uh, I think our IBD is about 22 megabytes. Um, and I think what we're aiming for is about a gig. You know, I mean, currently we're talking 100, you know, 50 megabytes will be plenty because our traffic isn't high enough. But I think the eventual goal is that you will store about a, a gigabyte of data. We, we use a proof MMR database, which Peter Todd uh, invented, very nice piece of tech, a hash tree basically. So that everybody has a complete copy of the UTXO. Um, and the trick is with Minima that I look after all the data that is relevant to me and you look after all the data that is relevant to you. And when we send the transaction, we include a proof of the existence and validity of that data. This means that everybody has to store orders of magnitude less data than is required. Yeah, so everybody doesn't store everything, but everybody can prove the validity of the data they have to everyone. Yeah, it's like a hash tree where everybody stores the root hash and then all the data that's in it can be proved, you Merkle branches, et cetera, et cetera. So the amount of data that you have to store is very small uh, and will continue to be so, you know, in perpetuity. Uh, I'm hoping that, you know, it, it needs to run on the phone that I've got right now forever. So, and it does. So that, that's good. Small amount of day. Great. Um, guys, this is the last call for questions. I do have another one from Den Joe. Could you explain how it is proof against quantum computers? So actually there is, you know, uh, a branch of mathematics that we know is, you know, secure against quantum computers. So 
Um, currently, Bitcoin and Ethereum use ECDSA signatures, RSA. These are factorization issues that we know are not secure against quantum computers. But a Lamport signature, which interestingly enough uses hashing, which is the beating heart of all these blockchains, is quantum secure. So that's actually just a design decision that we took. It's not like we have to come up with anything special for it. It's just that we only use technology and mathematics that we know is quantum secure. And that means that you have to, you know, there's trade-offs there. Like there's lots of very cool stuff that you can't use. Zero knowledge snarks are not quantum secure, so you can't use them, yeah? Starks that are not ready for mass consumption and public use are, but they'll be coming in, in 20 years. And we have a, you know, we have a, we have a way of velvet forking them in uh, for the for the for the proof history. But um, as long as you're careful at the beginning, you can just choose mathematics that is quantum secure. So that's what we've done. And we don't use anything that isn't quantum secure. Okay. And um, same person, Denjo. Follow up question: yep. What happens to mobiles that have the node, but you switch your phone off for a few days? Let's say. Yeah, you resync to the network. It's pretty simple, really. So each user, um, I mean, currently, you know, your phone store has 64 gigabytes. What's that, the minimum? So we expect, and the protocol um, has you store about five full days of messages so that should you lose connection, you just connect to the network and you re-download all that. Uh, frankly, I don't think I've been disconnected from WhatsApp for more than 20, you know, for more than 24 hours for about three years. And in 10 years time, if you're not connected to the internet for more than 10 minutes, your friends are going to call the police. Yeah, that's where we're going. It's going to be, you know, the, the idea of you not being connected to the internet with everything that's happening. I, I just think it, it's just never going to happen. But if you do lose connection, you're on a plane, you're on a desert island, something happens, you can reconnect to the network and, and you can re, you know, download and resync, no problem. Very good. I think that's it for questions. Oleg, did you have anything you wanted to follow up with? Or? I think uh, since, I mean, I, I see only have the questions for some reason anyway, but since I don't see any more questions, I think we are good. So I'm stopping the recording. Thanks.